Hi, everybody. Russ and my hammers 11. Hope you're all safe and well. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell icon. So you may have any time to put new content on. As always, we'd like to thank our channel sponsors. Untuck it. Check them out in the description below. Today's guest is, is our first professional golfer we've had. Um, and also is our first ever uh, Ryder Cup captain as well. Funny that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you know, Paul, uh, Paul McGinley, um, professional golfer, Ryder captain, um, he, obviously, the 2002, uh, the old 10 foot against Furyk on the 18th and Belfry, still uh, still something which I still remember very, very vividly. Um, and, and lots of other accolades. And, you know, obviously, there's a tournament wins. But more importantly, why he's on the show, he's is a West Ham fan. And that, 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 that's, that's all that's all that powers in comparison to being a hammer. How are we, Paul? How are you, man? Good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Well, happy hammer have, at the moment, that's for sure. Yeah, we are. We are happy hammers at the moment, so we might as well enjoy it while we can. Um, how have you been in these sort of weird times we live in at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's make the most of a, a bad situation. I live in London, so um, full lockdown at the moment, and um, yeah, a bit of exercise every day. Whoa. Oh, and the Sorry, iPad's gone, so there we go. There, <laughs> there we go. Right, we're good now. <laughs> um yeah, full lockdown at the moment, a bit of exercise every day. I've got a bit of work to do, uh, do a lot of research, getting ready for the season, um, get a bit of training going, and uh, yeah, just kind of get, making the most of a, a very bad situation like everybody. Yeah, is is, and obviously we've had lots of lots of ex ex professional footballers on on the on the channel, and obviously they all play golf, and now they can't play golf at the moment, can they? So I don't know what they're going to be doing at the moment, particularly the London based uh, London based uh, ex players at the moment. Um, I didn't realize how much they all played golf, Paul, but they all play golf, so it's incredible yeah. how much golf these guys play. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. Yeah, well, it's. Uh... It's great. Age is no barrier when it comes to golf. So uh, with mm -hmm. the handicapping system as well, too, you can kind of play with players who are better than you or players that yeah. are worse than you and, you know, still have a good bet, uh, have a bit of game. And I think they're, they're also com great competitors. You know, professional sports people are competitive by nature. And I think uh, golf gives them uh, an outlet to continue that competitiveness. And, uh, yeah, certainly I, I, I come across a lot of ex -football. I'm a huge football fan. I always have been. And uh, it's always fun when you're, when you're drawn with or play with uh, an ex-player because uh, you know my my years growing up 1980s in particular 1990s uh, you know, that was that was when I 1980s was when I was actually 70s was when I started watching football but the 80s yeah. was when I really got uh, got into it really got into it yeah and obviously you know because because there's lots of because there's nothing to watch on telly everyone's been watching loads of loads of old highlights of sports and stuff like that and obviously all the Ryder Cup stuff has been on um you know on telly and on YouTube and stuff and it's it it I mean looking through looking through the Ryder Cup we don't talk about we're not it's not a golf channel or a football channel but I, but I can't take the opportunity to not talk to you about the Ryder I, Cup I, I, pref sorry. I prefer to talk about football <laughs> oh, okay no, no problem right there. but uh, no, yeah, I mean it's fine it's fine I mean, obviously, you know, uh, right, 2014 being being sort of the first ever um, Irishman to, to captain the the England uh, the, the England the European team. Um, obviously, they won fantastic. Um, aspirations to do it again. Aspirations to be to be captain again, Paul, sometime down the line. No, I think that that uh, that ship has sailed at this stage oh, now. Okay. No, it's uh, it's a one time only basis now i mean it only happens every two years yeah. uh, it's a huge honor to be captain and, and the reason why it's such a huge honor in europe is that your peers the players vote who the captain is sure. um so it's not a, a committee or it's not a group of people or a board it's actually the players themselves the players who are going to be playing and um, have a big input on who it's going to be so uh and of course to them you know basically because it's every two years and there's so many players there's 12 players in a right mm -hmm. team they all want to be captain so if you did it if, you, if somebody did it two or three times a lot of them would miss out so that that'd be unfair to do so now one time only and uh like uh like a heavyweight boxer or a retired or fated yeah one win from win <laughs> one, 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 exactly. one win from one i'm done i'm done yeah exactly 100 percent winning record that's what i like yeah that's no, very good <laughs> as we said, as we said, you're a you know a, a West Ham fan, which is, is obviously why we have you on here, Paul. Um, and the first question I usually ask people is why West Ham. So obviously, you know, why West Ham? Why is it your club, Paul? Why are you a West Ham fan? So I live in London now. I've lived here for over twenty years, uh, but I grew mm. up in Dublin, um, uh, right in the middle of Dublin, and um, nineteen seventy five. 
uh, cup final against Fulham. Uh, I was eight years old, seven years old, eight years old, yeah. And I was just starting to get into football. And uh, a fella down the road, we lived in a, in a semi, you know, semi-detached estate in, in the suburbs of Dublin. And Mr. Skelton, who lived one, two, three, four doors down from us, uh, was the only guy on the road with a colour TV. Um, so when the cup final was on in May, uh, being a Saturday, we were all invited in on the road to come and watch the cup final in colour. And uh, so kids, obviously, I still remember sitting in this front room uh, watching the cup final. And, you know, at that stage, I was only getting into football. And it was two teams. It was a claret and blue team um, or a black and white team. And because it was colour, the claret and blue stood out. <laughs> it's been something yeah, good point. They, they look fun. And uh, so I, I cheered for West Ham because of the colour of the strip. And, uh, you know, we obviously win. And, and, and West Ham, that, from day on, that day on, and, and um, you know, what, what we have in Ireland, uh, we have Gaelic football in Ireland, which is our biggest sport. Um, mm-hmm. And you have 80,000 people going to these games. It's a huge sport in Ireland. It's a cross between rugby and soccer. Mm-hmm. And what you have in Gaelic football is, unlike soccer, it's an amateur game, but there's no transfers. So you can only play for the county you're born in, the 32 counties. You can only play for the county you're born in. So it becomes incredibly parochial um, and you become very passionate about your team because that's, you know, your county. That's where you were brought up. You went to school, um, you know, uh, and, and, and that's your team for life. And, and that's kind of West Ham with me. You know, I had that connection with West Ham from that first game of football. I remember watching on colour TV. And I was just as passionate about West Ham as I was about anything else. I mean, I, I grew up also as a Celtic fan. My mom and dad are from Donegal in the top corner of Ireland. And uh, there's a big affinity between Donegal and Celtic. My mom used to go to the Old Firm games when she was younger uh, with, with her dad uh, over on the boat and the ferry. So there's Celtic as part of my roots as well. Um, but Rangers are are start not Rangers West Ham I mean rather is uh, <laughs> I have that affinity with West Ham like I would do with uh, with Celtic I would do with with Dublin and Donegal which are which are my roots as well. Yeah, it's, that's that's a brilliant that's a brilliant story, isn't it? I mean, we've, we've had lots, of, and it's funny how like, the FA Cup finals and things like that—that's what gets people youngsters into the into supporting West Ham. It's, it happens quite. If it's not seventy-five, it was it was eighty, or if they're very young, it was two thousand and six. You know, so uh, it'd be nice to get to another FA Cup final soon. I think uh, just to get. <laughs> get a few more fans in as well but uh no it's fantastic and, and as you said but i mean west ham and celtic there's there's a uh, there's a lot of connection there there's a lot of players who have played for both isn't it obviously maca and hartson and decanio and got mm. colton cole and berkovich and liam brady and you know there's loads of them isn't it so there's always this sort yeah. of um i remember going up there to parkhead for the um we had a, a friendly many years ago 10 years ago seven, fifteen 15 years ago it was an absolutely amazing atmosphere it was, it was fantastic but uh yeah and once you're in you're in aren't you once you once you uh mm. once you've picked your colors unless you're one of these you know fair weather fans once you pick your colors you're in aren't you on your point as you said that claret and blue just popped on that uh, on that tv screen yeah brilliant story love that that's that's fantastic man that's really really well, good that was the case um, i mean grow, growing up yeah that that was that was the case for me growing up in, in, in Dublin then, you know, I was probably the only West Ham fan uh, in Dublin at the time. Everybody was Leeds or Man United or Chelsea or Liverpool. And and and, and uh, I was West Ham and my dad used to go over to London once a year on business and he always brought me back to Jersey. So when I went, did my Gaelic training and did my soccer and all of that thing, I was always the guy in the West Ham jersey and Brilliant. I kind of stood out for that reason. Um, and, and that was me. And the more everybody was Liverpool and Chelsea and Man United, the more, oh, sorry, the more, the screen of mine yeah, is the, moving again. The, so more, silly, man. More I was, the more I was into West Ham. Yeah, totally. And, and, uh, and, yeah, very passionate. It's like that siege mentality, isn't it? You know, because you're the only one, so you want to be even more bigger as a West Ham fan because you're the only one. You feel like you have to make a bigger influence on people, particularly as, as you said, Leeds and Man United and Liverpool and stuff. But uh, and and obviously, you know, living in London and stuff, you know, get getting to the games and stuff like that. And um, I remember you being on the pitch, Upton Park. Um, just after, I think just after 2002, wasn't it? After the Ryder Cup, um, I'm pretty sure that Jeremy got you on the pitch. I remember that very well. I was, I was there. I remember that particularly well. And, uh, and as you said, West Ham, you know, it's just Upton Park, London Stadium. The fanatic fans, um, special, special bunch of fans. I think we are, aren't we? Really, um, I like to think that we are very special fans, really. 
Would oh, you agree? I couldn't agree more. I, I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's the connection for me, you know, the old East End. I remember the first time going there, um, I was working in Brussels at the time, this is before I was a professional golfer. I left college mm. in Dublin. I was a late developer as a golfer and, and uh, I was working six months in Brussels and I went to visit my auntie who lived in Fulham and um, I, uh, I went with her. I picked a weekend to go and visit her from Brussels. Um, I went to pick a weekend that West Ham will be playing at home. I'd never seen West Ham play before. Um, so I'm now, what am I? I'm 17, 18, 19, 20, I'm about 21. And, and I'm going to up the park for the first time, getting on the district line uh, at Fulham and going across the city, which I'd never been to London before. Going across the city, it took forever, right? Enough, but I, didn't mind. I was so excited going to the game. And, and I, even now I can feel the goosebumps coming on my, on my arm and, and as, I, as I think of that train journey and as I got closer and closer to West Ham and Upton Park um, and then getting out and, and you know, walking up Green Street and, and seeing the stadium for the first time um, you know, and, and going into the terrace. Um, I mean, it, it's, it was a hugely emotional for me. Even now, it's amazing. I'm, I'm still uh, really into um in, into those emotions it's, it's quite yeah. incredible uh, and, and that was me and and it, it was the authenticity of the club more than anything the authenticity mm. of 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 east enders london i was a punk rocker as a boy as well too um not a lot of people know that but punk rock was my thing that was my music as a teenager and, and even now even on my ipad you know i'm in the gym a lot of punk rock is still on there and of course london was the was the epicenter of punk rock yeah. Um, and you know, Sham 69, all of those kind of singing about, yeah, yeah, yeah. I deal with this screen. Sorry. Um, right. the clash, you know, all of these, uh, these bands, um, you know, yeah. singing with the London accent and my connection with West Ham and, and so, so kind of they molded together. And as I say, walking up and, and into the stadium for the first time, um, huge excitement, huge excitement. And, you know, I ended up being a season ticket holder there when I did move to London, um, for, a, for a large number of years until they moved out of, uh, up the park and and uh, even though I was on tour and you know only got a chance to go uh, not as much as I'd like you know I had lots of friends who are also became West Ham fans and you know gave them the p- tickets when I wasn't there and they were really yeah. good tickets and and yeah so that was it um, that was me West Ham and and still am to this day yeah. never miss a game when it's on TV and obviously look for the result all the time and follow things closely and the light yeah. of the Moyes is doing well too you know he's a guy that I've met playing golf over the years and. Uh, mm. Uh, he's a guy I liked uh, a lot, and then when he got the West Ham job, um, you know, I was pulling for him, and and then uh, then he left, and I was sad for him, and now he's come back again and doing really well. I'm I'm really yeah. happy for him. He's a smash guy, and yeah. uh, delighted that it's working out at the moment. Yeah, no, he is. He's, he's um, and and what I like about him is uh, what I like about this this second stint particularly is there's if there feels like it's it's going a bit back to the old school do you know what i mean in terms of getting he's got proper you know football people in the back in the back room staff with like stuart pierce and kevin nolan and there seems to be you know a bit like the old mentality where it doesn't matter who is who is putting the shirt on you knew they'd put in a hundred percent and with people like sue check and and uh, sue foul and bowie and these signings it's an exciting time to be a West Ham fan again at the moment. It's uh, although we still look, we still look behind with like one shoulder, don't we? It's like you know we're tenth, you know we've got twenty six points, fantastic, and then within the same breath, someone will say to me, 14 points to go, fourteen points to go," you know, just to get those forty points to, <laughs> to stay up. It's such a West Ham thing, but you're right; it's a sensory thing being a West Ham fan, as you said. You can watch all the games on telly. You probably get a better view now than you do if you're at the London Stadium. But it's a sensory thing. Is it's the smells? It's it's the togetherness. It's they said walking up to the ground. It's that long train journey, bless you, from Fulham to to Upton Park, and it's everything. I think that's what people miss. The sooner we get better, back the better. I think in terms of the fans, obviously when it's all safe and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's just typical. They're doing really well, and there's no one to watch them. No one to cheer them on, fools. Yeah, in the house, in the game itself. But uh, it is what it is, Paul, isn't it? We can't do much about much about it. But um, no, anyway. it's not. You know, I mean. Well, one of one of the things you know, there's two things really. Uh, I I know Trip Smith, who's a, who's an investor there too. I played golf with yeah. Trip, and and uh, he's invited me there a few times. Um, and luckily, I'll be able to sit in the chairman's suite, which is amazing. Anybody's had that honor. It's an amazing, amazing facility that they've got there. Um, and you know, one of the things I talked to Trip about, and and you know, as a West Ham fan, and and being a fan for so many years, you know, I'm not expecting West Ham to win the league. You know, that's. Yeah. 
pie in the sky at this moment of time. Yes, Leicester, you could say Leicester have won it, but you know, that was unique. It was different. The way the money is and the way things are and the size of West Ham and all that, it's it's on it's highly, highly, highly unlikely. as a West Ham fan, you're not calling for them to win the league. Obviously, you don't want to get relegated, as you quite rightly say. But the two things that I look for in in a West Ham as a West Ham fan personally, and this is just my view, is that I want to have a run in the cup. We can legitimately win a cup. Um, you know, our, our history is based on winning cups. And when it comes to either, you know, the, the old league cup or, or the FA cup, I want us to put out our best team and I want us to have a real go at winning that cup. And mm -hmm. I don't want to go out to Oxford like we did and get beaten by Oxford. You know, we've we got to be on the front foot and we've got to be beating these teams and treating this like our, this is our premiership. You know, I know it's yeah. important to say the premiership, but I really want to see us at least have a 100% go at winning a cup. That's the first thing I want as a West Ham fan. Um, and and uh, you know the 2006 final you mentioned earlier there I was at that game and I mean I can't tell you how good it I was walking out of that stadium and even Stephen Gerrard who I've met a few times now and even now he's on the other side of the fence up at uh, up at up at Celtic <laughs> Rangers I mean I see him every time I see him my heart drops even though he's a really nice guy and I like him it's like what he did to me that day in the last minute it was it was so unfair and so wrong you know we were a better team that day and you know we were almost there. But so the first thing is winning a cup. And the second thing I, I say this trip is that and as a West Ham fan, I've always what I love about the club, um, besides from from the authenticity of, of the fans and the East End and you know the heartbeat of, of London, um, what I really, really am connected with West Ham and love to see every time I go to the games is I want to see elevation of academy players into the first team. Yeah. And you know, I know the game has changed over the last 20 years or so, um, but I still want to see those guys coming through. I remember Glenn Johnson on his debut. I remember, you know, Rio on 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 you know, Frank Lampard. You know, Joe Cole. I remember, you know, I was I was at a lot of those games when they were making their debut and brought on as a as a substitute. And the buzz around the stadium because we all knew who these people were. They were mm. one of us. They were one of us who came through the academy. We, we watched them in, in all the tables in the program about how they've been doing and talking yeah. about them, highlighting this guy is going to be in the first team squad soon and watching their elevation, and watch how, how all the, those academy teams do. And Tony Carr was doing that so brilliantly. And, you know, one after the other, they come through. But the buzz that went out in the stadium when one of those guys came on, particularly as a substitute and introduced, it was like he was a 50 million pound silent. Yeah. Uh, and it was only because he was true and he was West Ham. And, and, and that's what I want to see. And, you know, I think we've lost a way. I know it's more difficult in the modern times, but the academy is not producing the same kind of players it used to. Um, mm. You know, I, I went through a stat not long ago. Let me see if I remember. It was something like, what was it? It was something like of the top, I, I could be could be corrected on this, but the guys who made the most appearances for West Ham ever in the history of the club, I think it was 10 of the top 12 came from the academy. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, mm. and that that's what I want. Is, that's what West Ham's about. I want to see yeah. these guys bred in. I know the game has changed and it can't be as romantic as it might have been way back in the 60s, 70s, 80s with guys being one club and one club only. But I still want to see the elevation of these guys coming through and, and uh, yeah. you know, like the Mark Nobles. And, and you know, that that's what the real connection for the fans is with the club. I, I know we've yeah. lost something when we've moved away from Upton Park, but we've also lost something because the academy is not quite as 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 um producing the same level and number of players than it used to as well and i think that's a big miss and i'd love to see loads of money invested into that academy um, yeah you know yeah. and producing real authentic uh, west ham players yeah and i think i think moise is the right man for the job um for that you know what i mean it's where you know so it, you know with the more sort of european or the more foreign-based coaches it's all about bringing their players in bringing their whereas moise you know he, he's, he's come out and said he wants to build another everton basically that's what he wants to do and to be honest he, i'd let him do it because as you said it's building this we've, we've had tony Carr on we've had loads of like the the youth team guys on like kevin Keane. he's you had zavon we've had uh mark phillips we've had conch they're all like in the in the setup now the youth teams and it is about having that sort of procession 
progression, whatever it is, uh, conveyor belt of of of, uh, of young boys coming in um, into the. As you said, there's nothing better than to see someone like Declan Rice, um, you know, establish himself as an England international as a captain, and he's, or, 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 you know, obviously we got when he was 14, but still, you know, it's it's it still counts, and um, yeah, and people like Ben Johnson and stuff like that. There's there's you know. I think you know there's there's guys there, but you're right. It's not the that that sort of that golden era of, of Joe Cole and Rio and Frank, and um, that was a, a special time for the for the academy. And Tony knows that for sure because um, we did. Yeah. I mean, Tony Tony did his eleven, and his eleven was the academy eleven, and pretty much it was the England 2010 um, World Cup team because um, he included John Terry as well because he he coached him through the academy and stuff. But um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully a cut run this year. Stop Port away. The Ian Dowie Derby, who knows, man? Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, I think everyone wants to see a good cup run for once. Um, it'll be good. We're well, well overdue one. We're well overdue one. The 2006, you know, what was it 16 years, 15 years since the last one? I think we're due one this year. But there'll be no fans typically probably there, which is the typical <laughs> West Ham thing, isn't it? <laughs> now, moving oh, on well, to your... your even, moving, not. They, I think people won't care, will they? It's, it's, you know, it's one of those things where... It's, it's, you know, the, the world we live in at the moment, it's, you know, unfortunately, I think actually fans not being at the stadiums, it's become a bit like the norm now, isn't it, really? People are used to it. 16 or 17 home games we've had there now. Um, and, yeah, it's a typical West Ham thing. They're performing well. Uh, and uh, and when fans did go back in, we lost 3-1 to Man United. So there you go. There you go. It's the West Ham way, Paul. You've, you've been a fan long enough to know that's the case, isn't it? But, um, yeah, no, it's good old West Ham. <laughs> Right, let's talk about your eleven, Paul. So everyone we've had on the on the channel, um, apart from um three people, Harry Redknapp, Ian Bishop, and Nigel Rear Coker, everyone else has given an eleven. Um so the idea is um it, you can pick whoever you want, doesn't really matter. But the only rule is you have to be alive to have seen them play. So obviously, you know, from you, you sort of the, the mid seventies onwards, basically. So that's not not a bad bunch of players really to pick from. There might maybe too many to be honest. Um, but you can pick whatever formation, doesn't matter, Paul. It's all about players that mean something to you. Um so if we started um between the sticks, in goal, who's in goal for the McGinley eleven? That's what everyone wants to know. I'm a little bit romantic here, going back to my childhood. Um, so I'll be picking one of the older ones, in Mervyn Day or, or Phil Parks. Um, so I'm going to go Phil Parks. Uh, yeah, he would be my choice uh, as goalkeeper. Yeah, fantastic man, fantastic. You, you must have you, you must have met Phil. You must have met Phil before. Yeah, I've met him at West Ham, and, and uh, you know, great hair. I wish I wish I could have heard like him <laughs> at the age he's at. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, yeah, but he was no. great. I mean, those days, um, you know, I remember those days uh, very clearly, the 80s in particular. So a lot of the players I'm going to pick are, are nostalgic reasons and, and, and 80s reasons and, in particular. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, you'd match it a day and a Saturday night and that was it. There was no Sky, obviously, and very few live matches, if any. And, and what we used to do was uh, was listen to Radio 5 and, you know, with Clint in Dublin, we didn't get a very good reception in Dublin. So... <laughs> Uh, uh, BBC Two it was at the time, uh, BBC Two, BBC Radio Two, um, uh, and uh, I remember uh, tuning in that and, and uh, sitting in the kitchen uh, listening to the West Ham games, particularly the, particularly the semi finals, cup semi finals. Yeah, um, fantastic. So yeah, a little bit nostalgic with some of my picks no. here that are coming forward. No, 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 no. It's, it's people that mean something to you, and that was a that was a very special time in, in your West Ham career, Paul. So yeah, we will put Parks in. Obviously, he turned 70 over the first lockdown. Um, God bless him. Um, right. OK, let's go into defence, Paul. Um, sh are you going to you gonna play four at the back? Or are you going to do anything clever four at the back? You know, what are we going to do? I don't know. Go for the, the three at the back, Moisey? Or what are we going to do? <laughs> well, seeing as, we're, seeing as we're thinking that mostly in the 80s, we've got to pick players that would fit a 4-2-4 formation. Uh, yeah. Or a 4-4-2 formation, runner. So... Obviously, Billy Barnes is the first defender that comes to mind. You know, um, yeah. I was fortunate to meet Billy last year, first time I'd ever met him, and uh, wow, uh, I, I just love everything about Billy Barnes. Um, you know, epitome way at the time in terms of fitness and everything that he did, led with his heart and his sleeve. Um, you know, great captain, twenty odd years at the club. Um, yeah. I think he might I think he might be the most appearances for West Ham. You'd know that better than me. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, just a good man, you know, quiet, goes about his business. And, and I met him uh, 
last year got a great picture uh, of, of him with Trevor Brooking uh, at West Ham when I was there last year. And uh, great that they've named the, uh, the stand after him as well, too. He really is uh, something special. So uh, he'd be the first man that I would put down as a defender. And I put Alvin Martin beside him then. Um, oh. Yeah, I know he's a, he's a scouser, but, uh, you know, he's, uh, he, again, a fulcrum of, of everything that we did uh, yeah. at West Ham. Um, stood up for so much, you know, you got Rio in there as well too. It's hard to leave out Rio, with, particularly with the career that he went on to have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm probably going going outside my reaches there. But then I'd say, you know, the, the, the backs, uh, the, the uh, full backs, I mean, Ray Stewart at right back, I remember any time there was a penalty, it was a given when he was taking it. Uh, there wasn't <laughs> many anybody better in the game like a penalty than Ray Stewart. Uh, so I'll go with him, and, and I'm going to go Frank Lampard as well uh, at left back. Uh, nice. you know, uh, I think you know, he's closely connected with the club um, right through his. You know, it's a shame that the connection is not quite the same now as it was because uh, you know time has moved on. But but he mm. he put so much into the club and and stood for so much in the club. Uh, again, like Billy Barnes, incredibly fit, always was fit. Um, and uh, you know him. Him at left back would uh, certainly be again. I think about Billy. He might. He's up there with Billy in terms of appearances, isn't he? But West Ham, yeah. Yeah, most ever appearances. So you know, it's hard good. to leave somebody like that out. He's true West Ham, you know. And then mm. to produce an offspring like he did with Frank Junior as well. Uh, he did a lot for West Ham. He did. He did. And I, I totally agree. I think. I think it's 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 a it's a shame that that Frank Lampard Senior isn't isn't revered in the same light as you said a billy bonds or a you know trevor brookin or you know or bobby moore because he played 600 games something like that for west ham and he gave Mm. so much but as you said the uh, that's that's one of my things i want to i want to try and get some recognition again for frank senior because i think he he bloody deserves it the amount of games he played for west ham and so um yeah, no, yeah, I, t- I'm, I'm, I totally agree with what you say there, Paul. Right, let's move into midfield then. Who are we going to have in midfield then? Lots of choices for you. Well, I mean, the first name obviously has got to be Trevor Brooking. Um, I've got say, to know yeah. Trevor very well in the last 20 years since I moved to London. And uh, he's become a really good friend of mine. And, and I've really enjoyed him and Hilka's company anytime I'm there. We always hook up and see them. Um, he's just everything you want about a person as well as being a West Ham guy through and through so passionate about the club now um you know one of the things that nearly moved me to tears well was was you know that when he was manager for that short spell of time and we nearly did the unthinkable and get out of the relegation um you know he was so passionate do you ever see trevor so passionate on a line like he was playing playing for england or playing for west ham he was never showing that kind of emotion um and and you know they did so much and i think we it's, it's, if my memory's right we, the first team, the highest number of points the team ever got relegated with. Um, and, and that was good mention for him and for the club at the time. And so so Trevor is everything about West Ham. And, and as a person, anybody who's been lucky enough to meet him, um, he's everything um, that you'd want in a human being. He really is somebody special. And uh, he's obviously my number one by a long, long way up there with Billy Bonds. Those two will be the first two on the time, uh, on the on the team sheet. Um, I've got a opinion with my connection with... Uh, with my connection with uh, with uh, with Celtic, I've got to be putting in the Canio in particular. Um, uh, if you've ever got the chance to be Harry, I know you've been around Harry and you've interviewed him. But when Harry starts telling Paolo stories um, in the dressing room, and he can do his voice and he can do his accent, and he embellishes the story obviously the way only Harry can do. I mean, he'll have you in stitches and in tears. And again, I've been lucky to play a lot of golf with uh, with, with Harry over the years, and 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 there's always new stories, you know. And and he's got the connection as well right back to um you know the bobby moores and the jeff Hurst yeah. and all of those who he would have played with so you know if you ever want a history on west ham and it's so passionate like i said earlier at the gaa with me in ireland and the passion of west ham you know harry has that with west ham yeah. i know he's gone and different things have gone in different ways but he's still he's west yeah. ham um and, and and his heart and soul is in the east end um yeah. and you know going back to all of those times that i was reading about in the 70s and 80s and 60s and the players coming through and a training ground and all the stuff that was going on harry lived that life and he's able to bring to life those stories that i was reading about so um him talking about paolo um i was was it was it the game wimbledon when he scored an amazing goal i think it was wasn't it? i was at that game yeah. uh, and he scored it from the from the left side of the box and i was right behind him so i got an unbelievable view right down um 
right down uh, of where he, where he, where where he uh, had the shot from, and it was just incredible. It was almost like it happened in slow motion. Anybody who was yeah. there, it was quite incredible. And then when he would score there, when he would score, um, the celebrations that he had were just so real and so and so funny and so passionate. And of course, the more emotional he got, the more emotional the fans got, and the whole yeah. stadium went to another level when Paolo scored because it meant so much. Um, I mean, by all accounts, so Harry, I'll tell you, there's nothing guys trained better than him or worked harder than he did. Yep. You know, we all think about the eccentricities that he had, but I believe he was a very, very tough trainer and a hard worker yeah. and very, very passionate about West Ham. So, you know, I'd put him in there. And again, they're going to be nostalgia as well. I'll put in Alan Devonshire as well, too. You know, Alan yeah. Devonshire was that that guy with um, that, that turn of speed um, and, and that dribbling ability um, that, could, that could score a goal um, or create a goal for West Ham back in the 80s. He was a really important part of, of that success that they had and came through in the 70s as well. So, you know, I'll have him in there. And then Joe Cole. Joe Cole is one of the best players I've ever seen play. Um, I, I really do. Um, I, I remember, again, Joe coming on for his for his debut uh, at West Ham and and the skill level that he had w- was just oh. phenomenal. And, you know, I followed his career closely. I was always a fan of whatever team he was playing for if they weren't playing against West Ham. Um, and, you know, I... I I think he's he's great pundit now too. I love listening to him on TV, but he was something really, really special. Um, mm. And you know, this, in terms of a skill level, uh, he was he was right up there. Um, mm. So how many many is that? How many have I gone in there? That's you know, four, that's, that's you're not giving me enough. Eleven's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Mark Noble and Scott Parker haven't gone in there. They're two guys I'd like to fit in there somehow too. But as I say, I'm a little bit nostalgic with all the eighties picks. Yeah, well, that's, that makes perfect sense. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's the, the people that, that come front to mind, isn't it, Paul, with these things? And um, yeah, we can put we can put Mark and Scott on the bench. They're okay, don't worry. We, we, we'll, we'll, I'll give a couple of bench players for you as well. But I mean, yeah, as you said, someone like, you know, could you imagine Joe and Joe and uh, Dev on the same team? Cool. On the mm. on the sort of the bowling greens of London Stadium, rather than the the mud fields of of Stamford Bridge when, <laughs> when they beat Chelsea four 0 and stuff, but uh, yeah, no, f- a phenomenal place. I mean, that's it. That's a really good point about the pitches. Actually, you know, them being so skillful players, how they would have been on, yeah. on really good football pitches that we have nowadays. Yeah, it's um, it's incredible. It's like when we interviewed like Macca and stuff, and and we talk about football nowadays and he's like yeah but you go and watch us beat chelsea 4-0 on a sand pit of stamford bridge and so i did and went back i was like oh my god like seriously you know, nowadays it's like you know the, the the grass is like almost cut with scissors to a precise level and it's uh it's incredible what they were doing like people like trevor and and, and dev and people like that at that time was absolutely phenomenal and i think uh, for the younger fans or less experienced fans i don't call them younger fans less experienced fans i don't think they truly appreciate how the, the playing conditions and the balls and the and the, and the and the boots and stuff like that, even in sort of the eighties, how they were so different from nowadays, where everything's like feather light, it seems. But uh, now, top guys, I mean, we, so we've we've had people like Dev on before, and oh, I, I could listen to Dev talk about football all all day. Incredible man, lovely guy. Um, right, okay, who's going to be up front? Who's going to get these goals for the beginning eleven? That's the question, Paul. That's the question. Who's going to get your goals, man? <laughs> Well, uh, another guy that I've got to know well over the years and he's become a good friend and come, has come to a lot of events. Um, he's got a young nephew, actually, who's a really good golfer. Uh, it's Pop Robson. And oh, uh, Pop was a goal scorer and he could score goals and, and just become a good friend. And, and I've got to know him a lot. And he's just a smashing guy. Um, and uh, I'd be very happy to uh, to have him in the team. I think he would, uh, with all the creativity we'd have in midfield, I think there'd be lots of opportunities. And there wasn't many at finding the net uh, than, than Pop Robson. He was a true goal scorer. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, guys like, you know, there's so many you think about up front, you know, guys like David Cross, for example, up front from the 80s, you want to put him in. Uh, to Antonio from the modern day, I mean, you know, muscular and powerful and so important to the team dynamic that we have at the moment. It's easy to, uh, you know, it's not easy to pick two up front, but I'm going to go for two little guys. And, and one of them is Pop. The other one I'll pick will be, uh, will be Cuddy, Tony Cuddy. Uh, yeah. Again, another born goal scorer and um, through West Ham. And uh, he will be a guy that I would really uh, fancy putting away a lot of the chances that will be scored from that midfield. Yeah, so I'm going exactly. to go with the two little guys up front. Nice. And actually, they compl- and, then, and you know, we've, obviously we've had TC on 
Pop Robson one of, was one of his big idols. We've had David Cross on. Pop was one of his big idols as well. So I think people don't realise the the significance that Pop Robson played, not only as a player, but obviously the significance on other players who have been legends at West Ham as well. It, uh, you know, and it's, um, again, he's another one, which I don't think he doesn't get enough accolades for in terms of what he did for West Ham, Pop did particularly. Um, but yeah, him and Cotty, mm. goh. There'll be some goals there. There'll be some goals there, wouldn't there? But it's, yeah. uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, there were two goal scorers. That's what they did. They scored yeah. goals. I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't say all due respect. Either of them would have been incredibly dynamic, like the way the candle would be. But what they could do was convert half a chance, and and uh, that's what's missing a lot in the modern game. I think of yeah. uh, of a lot of players. You know, a Gary Lineker style. You know, again, who wouldn't have been the most dynamic player by his own admittance, but could sniff out a goal, could sniff out a half chance mm. and had the balls when he went one-on-one -on -one to finish more times than not. Um, you know, they're, they're the kind of uh, guys that uh, you would, you they would fetch, you know, 50, 75, hundred million nowadays. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, look at I mean, someone like Dev, for example, I mean, Dev, we bought him for five grand from, um, from, you know, uh, Southall, you know, so, and, and now what would, it, would yeah. he be worth in today's money and stuff? But, uh, no, it's, it's brilliant. No. And, and as you said that, but then I think that's sort of modern day, that sort of Cotty esque and type goal scoring. You don't get a lot of them at all in, in the premier league at all. Now it's no. all, they're all forwards. Even like Vardy is more of a forward, you know, Danny Ings is more of a forward now. Um, you don't get those true strikers anymore. Um, sort of probably the last one was probably something like Jermaine Defoe, mm. probably, um, and but he's obviously doing still doing stuff in with the uh, with the older uh, the old enemy up, up up top as well with uh with, with stevie g as well so uh, <laughs> god bless <laughs> Paul man it's been absolutely uh, fantastic <laughs> it's been lovely chatting to you thank you so much for your time i really appreciate you you're a busy man so um thank you i really really appreciate your time um it's been lovely reminiscing and chatting with you about west ham Pleasure. um Thank you. And obviously, thank you to everyone for watching as well or, or on, on Spodca Spodcast, on podcast or whatever, Spotify, Google, um, Apple, whatever it is. Give it a like, give it a share. And and from myself and from Paul, take care, everyone. Um, stay safe. Wash those hands. Uh, come on your irons. And we'll see you again very, very soon. Take care, everyone. Much love. See you later. Bye-bye.